guys. Welcome back to an episode of Clapback Culture. It's your girl, Jules Jesse, and I'm back. Um, we do apologize for not being here uh, the week or last week. Um, Omari and I both were caught up um, and the entire Converge family um, was celebrating the homegoing um, service of one of the fallen soldiers in um, in Seattle. And so we, we send our love and prayers to the postman and everything that was going on into our team there. So anyway, you guys, it's so good to be back. Um, lots has happened in the past two weeks and we're going to get down to some of that. But of course, I want to start with some of our headlines. Okay. Um, listen, you guys, we had an election. Okay. The midterm elections are over. And now the Republicans have slightly taken over the House. And so, you know, when you come over, I got to give you some of our political news. But guess what? The Republicans now won the House and they're planning to move forward with an investigation into the uh, the Bidens. I mean, this just gives uh, it's it's comedy. In the words of President Joe Biden, this is absolute comedy. So here's the story. The two top House Republicans, um, Representative James Comer and Representative Jim Jordan, they're expected to chair the House Oversight and Judiciary Committee, and they are planning to move forward with this investigation into um, Hunter Biden um, and President Joe Biden in terms of um, a Hunter's relationship with Ukraine and the gas oil company all of those things are getting brought back up. And so here's what they're trying to say. They're trying to say that um, President Biden engaged in influence peddling. That's what they're calling it, influence peddling. That's the thing now. Um, and so they wanted, they're basically alleging that President Biden, um, it, during his term and serving as vice president under the Obama administration, may have been offended financially. So all of that stuff is getting resurfaced and they would like to use their time as the head of the committee on oversight and judiciary to investigate President Joe Biden. And, you know, Republicans are expected to hold a very slim majority. Right. And so we we know that we're going to see some shift in the House. However, it's it's not going to make much of a, a, a big outcome. Right. Um, or at least in a sense, it's not what the GOP es essentially had forecasted um, during the midterm elections. They just thought it was going to be this red wave and it, it turned out not to be. So to win the House and then to say, OK, our focus is going to be on this investigation with President Joe Biden. We want to see if he benefited financially during his term as vice president and we're going to take him down. Um, I, I think this is honestly a witch hunt. Um, you know, the White House has shot back calling the investigation a conspiracy theory. Um, and I, I second that notion that it's absolutely a conspiracy theory. And to be honest and to be quite frank, who cares? I mean, I think as the American people, if Joe Biden had some influence in his son's business dealings, I feel like that's par for the course in terms of what everybody else is doing. I mean, corruption at that level whether big or small, is just there. Um, and so it's hard to, I think, for Hunter Biden to go into any business relationships without having that business representative know that he is the son of a vice president or now a sitting president of the, of the United States of America. So that absolutely is at the forefront. Everybody knows that. Um, and so with that being said, uh, these guys are going to be looking into bank statements. Um, they feel like they have some money transfers between um, Joe Biden and his son, Hunter. And they're going to try to tie those to the business dealings to see if there's anything mucky in the waters there. Um, and they say that we believe, you know, he may have been involved in may have been involved financially in some of the business dealings. But at the very least, we believe we need to investigate if these shady business deals have compromised this White House. <sighs> it's just nothing to be said about that, you guys. It's just nothing to be said about that. Um, so that is what uh, House Republicans are going to be spending their time on. Welcome to our government. 
All right, you guys, uh, moving forward, um, I wanted to just bring this case full circle. You guys know I love me some good law, but Gabby Petito's family was awarded a $3 million uh, wrongful death judgment um, for uh, from the estate of Brian La Laundry. That's, you know, her boyfriend who allegedly murdered her. Um, and I'm going to say allegedly because it's not necessarily proven, but we're almost sure that happened. And the judgment basically comes after, and if you could just pull that overlay back up, there's a tweet from a reporter who has been following this story. And he, he basically says, the judge ruled for G Gabby Petito's parents in the amount of $3 million. The estate isn't worth anywhere near that amount. So the $3 million is mostly inconsequential. This is, it's an arbitrary number. $3 million is just this arbitrary number to kind of satisfy um, the family. I don't think they're ever going to get this type of money. As you guys remember from the case, I mean, Brian uh, Laundry and uh, Gabby were living out of a van. Um, I, I mean, I, I guess it sets precedence, right? If, if anybody legal is on, I think this establishes uh, precedence here. Um, they're not going to get any money. They're, they're most definitely not going to get their daughter back. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's it's kind of a win for the, the wrongful death lawsuit. Um, and, you know, again, here we are. You know, this is full circle. Gabby's body or Gabby was reported missing. You guys, if you remember back September 2021. Uh, so we are a year post that. And then they they get this judgment. So this is just more symbolic than it is anything. So congratulations to uh, the Petito family on this victory. Even though you won't see any monetary movement, um, I think this is still a win for their family. What are your thoughts here? You guys let me know. Um, what else do I want to talk to you guys about? Oh, where are all my Swifties? Any Taylor Swift fans in the house? I'm not a Taylor Swift fan at all. I don't know any of her music, um, unfortunately, which is crazy because as big of a star as she is, um, I, I couldn't quote anything that has anything to do with Taylor Swift, but I do have a colleague, Nicole, if you're watching, um, Hey girl, Hey. And she was like, it's impossible to get these Taylor Swift tickets. Well, while I'm not here to advocate on behalf of all the Swifties who did or did not get their tickets to her new concert. What I do want to bring light to is the fact that government officials are putting Ticketmaster on blast because of this monopoly. If you guys remember, there was a merger between uh, Ticketmaster and Live Nation. And so now we have this huge monopoly and they're accusing the platform of failing to meet the demand sufficiently. Uh, do we have a video for this? Let's play the video. We'll come back and we'll talk about it. Some U.S. leaders are getting on the bandwagon as well, calling Ticketmaster a monopoly. So let's dig into what that means. Senator Amy Klobuchar said, what is going on with Ticketmaster? It's an example of why we need strong antitrust enforcement. Monopolies wreak havoc on consumers and our economy when there is no competition to incentivize better services and fair prices. We all suffer the consequences. AOC said, uh, daily reminder that Ticketmaster is a monopoly. Its merger with Live Nation should never have been approved and they need to be reined in. Break them up. Well, Wake Forest University Assistant Professor of Finance Kenneth Ford gives us the finer points of a business monopoly. A monopoly is essentially when you have a market where there's only one seller of a good or service. So in this case, uh, it seems as if Ticketmaster it's the only entity or business providing access to tickets directly to consumers. Well, Ford says Ticketmaster, Ticketmaster acts as a monopoly in many different ways. When it joined with concert promoter Live Nation, it really took over the live music market. But the situation that we saw with Taylor Swift ticket sales isn't what the government would typically go after. The government are, is concerned about prices. Right. So if two banks merge and now there's only one bank in, in the area, is that going to hurt banking prices for consumers or um, and in this case. The prices per se weren't hurt, but rather access to buying the tickets. Right. The system crashed um, and it couldn't handle the, 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 the demand for people wanting to buy tickets at that time. 
Okay, so prices, not the big problem for fans during pre-sale. But those shopping resale are looking at shelling out thousands of dollars. Take a look at StubHub for Taylor Swift's Saturday night concert in Atlanta. This one made my heart skip a beat. Tickets are going for as much as $74,000. Okay, you guys, who got 74K to drop on the Taylor Swift? So I agree with Leon that this is bad for fans, bad for musicians, and bad for venues because ultimately what's going to happen is that people just are going to cap out you know and so once these once these tickets went on sale you guys um you know cap capital one had a pre-sale so if you are a card holder for capital one then you were kind of automatically thrown in this queue well the platform ultimately crashed so even if you are a capital one member if you are a regular member in in the queue all of these pre-sales pre-sale tickets that went live um, it was just like all hell broke loose, chaos. People were in queues for hours, 8, 10, 11, 12 hours. And then by the time they got to check out, they, were, they weren't even able to check out. It was an error message and things of that nature. One Twitter user even posted that his card was charged 16 times um, and overdrafted. And we're talking about ticket sales of like $560. So he was like, I didn't get any tickets. My account is overdrawn. My bank card is is being um, flagged for fraud and I'm broke and don't have any money and still don't got these tickets. So this type of thing, you guys, we really need to um, really advocate for uh, not this monopoly. I mean, it's unreal to me that Ticketmaster felt like they couldn't have anticipated this. If millions of people signed up to be on the pre-sale list, how are you able to... Um, really support that on your platform, right? Like that just doesn't make any sense. But if this was broken up and you could buy your tickets from multiple websites, from multiple um, sources, you wouldn't have this problem. And then you wouldn't have this huge inflation on, on ticket sales. So I also feel like fans as well as musicians and artists should really, you know, advocate for that for for a breakup, right? There has to be a breakup um, because it's seventy two thousand dollars for a ticket. On top of all the scams, right? So people who are really interested, um, you know, this concert's not even I think until summer of twenty twenty three. So folks are trying to buy these tickets now. Um, I urge you to wait, okay? Because the scammers are out there, you guys. They are planning to take your money. There's a lot of shady business on the internet. Um, to get these tickets and, you know, just sometimes you just might not make it. So with that being said, Ticketmaster isn't even selling the tickets anymore. How about that? Like that, how ironic is that? Um, so I guess it is what it is. They said, you know, they described the platform as historically unprecedented demands. That's what they put out in a tweet. So it sounds like they're a little bit proud um, at the millions of people that tried to jump out here, but I don't think that was the, the intention of Taylor Swift um, in the beginning of all of this. So let me see you guys, before we move on, um, I do want to talk about one more topic. I want to talk about your boy, Elon Musk, child, Lord have mercy. What are your guys' thoughts on Elon Musk taking over Twitter? As you know, he has stayed in the news but recently, a memo has come out um, where he has given employees an ultimatum. He is saying, listen, either you're going to commit to, and I quote, extreme hardcore work, or you can get out, okay? And so he says, going forward to build a breakthrough Twitter 2.0 and succeed in an increasingly competitive world, we will need to be extremely hardcore, this means working long hours at high intensity. Only exceptional performance will constitute on a passing grade. If you are sure that you want to be a part of this new Twitter, please click yes or click no. Um, but if you click yes, it would take you to a form and you'd, you'd fill that out to stay on board. If not, he's going to offer you three months of severance spray and tell you thank you, but no thank you. And so a lot of Twitter employees were quitting. Um, and they, you know, posted the salute emoji and were, you know, just saying I'm out and I'm out. I don't know. 
know. I mean, here, here, I have a couple thoughts about this. Number one, Elon Musk does not uh, try to be anything he's not. He stands 100% on who he is. Um, and I think it's actually better to know what you're getting yourself into than kind of thinking that, you know, you have this new leadership and they kind of massage you and, you know, make you feel like everything is going to be okay. When really he's saying, no, I'm absolutely going to change the culture up in here. And if you're not, you know, subscribing to this, uh, demand this extreme hardcore work that I'm going to put you through, then maybe you can leave. I respect that without saying that that would be something that I would want to subscribe to, right? It does seem a bit weary, um, but he's ambitious and he has a lot of goals lined out on how he plans to change the platform and is pushing his staff to really achieve them as he attempts to quickly kind of like bolster the company's bottom line. So you know, Elon Musk is, is exactly who he says he is, whether we like it or not, you guys. Uh, so I, I salute all those people who stayed on board. Um, I'm inter interested to see how the culture at Twitter uh, will make or break the platform. Um, you guys know they just rolled out this new thing where you could pay for a verified check, which is ghetto, if you ask me. I mean, I wouldn't want to do it. You know what? You don't want anyone to pay for a verified check. Like, that's why the blue check is there. So you can earn it, right? So you can be the influencer. So you can earn that, not pay for it. Then now it's like, if anybody can get a check, then it's not that valuable. But that is what it is. But look, let's take a quick break. And when we come back, I want to talk to you guys about the Kyrie Irving suspension and a couple of things laid out along that. I want to get your thoughts on that. So stay tuned. You're watching Clapback Culture. Hey, Portland. Basic Gordon here. Not sure if you heard, but Trap Kitchen Weekend starts this Friday, November 18th at the Roseland Theater in downtown Portland. And you already know Converge Media has joined hands with the Trap Kitchen and we will be in the building. Join me, my Converge fam, Cool Nuts, G Perico, Jay Worthy, and Manny Blanco from VH1 Black in Compton as we celebrate food, music, and culture in a way that only the Trap Kitchen can. See you Friday for Trap Kitchen Weekend at the Roseland Theater, and be sure to follow Trap Kitchen PDX for more details and get your tickets today at roselandpdx.com. A world of wonder awaits at Pacific Northwest Ballet's The Nutcracker. Treat your loved ones to the Northwest's favorite holiday tradition at Seattle Center's McCall Hall. Tickets start at $27. Visit pnb.org. COVID-19 hurt my income, my health, and my family. We were about to lose our home when we heard we might be eligible for homeowner assistance funds from the government. We called 1-877-894-HOME, and a housing counselor stepped in, talked to our lender, and saved our home. Federal funding details at WashingtonHalf.org. That's WashingtonHAF.org. All right, y'all, welcome back. You're watching Clapback Culture. I'm your host, Jules Jesse. And I want to talk to you guys about this Kyrie Irving suspension. Okay. If you, you know, have been sleeping under a rock, then you don't know. But Kyrie Irving has come under fire for retweeting. I believe we talked about this like two weeks ago. Uh, two weeks ago, he retweeted... Um, what the media is calling a promotional tweet on a move on a documentary film called Negro or Hebrews to Negroes. Um, it then spiraled out of control to say that he was suspended for promoting a film that that was filled with um, anti-Semitic tropes um, on his social media accounts. So 
Kyrie didn't fully subscribe to that statement and was saying, you know, I'm not anti-Semitic. I don't hate anyone. Um, I love all people. But that wasn't enough uh, for the Nets. Um, it certainly wasn't enough for the NBA. And, you know, it, it, it caused for, you know, NBA commissioner Adam Silver to issue a public statement um, expressing his deep disappointment, um, a, a, along with all of these other folks kind of chiming in on that. So Kyrie stood on what he said and said, listen, you know, my platform, I didn't promote this film. I just simply said that I saw it and I retweeted it. And so I don't necessarily stand by everything that's in the film, but I'm going to post it, right? And so he came off anti-Semitic or he was labeled anti-Semitic. Well, in order for him to come back to the Nets, um, he was essentially charged with a five-game suspension but in order to be reinstated, this is where I have the issue, guys. In order for him to be reinstated by the team, he had to fulfill six requirements, okay? He had to, uh, let's put it up. He had to apologize and condemn the film he promoted. He had to make a $500,000 donation to anti-hate causes. He had to complete sensitivity training. He had to complete anti-Semitism training. He had to meet with the ADL and Jewish leaders, and he had to meet with the team's owner to demonstrate an understanding of the situation. Oh, Lord, Kyrie and good God almighty. This to me is the newest form of buck breaking. Um, okay. You know, Kyrie Irving put out a statement, whether you feel like he was a day late and a dollar short. He put out an apology statement, okay? And he fully expressed um, his sympathies, um, his empathy to the Jewish community. And he said, you know, listen, this is not what I stand for. I'm all about a guy who's about peace and love. I have a deep love for community. Um, and I had no idea that so many people were hurt. And because of that, I want to apologize. Um what we're seeing now and why I feel like this is a deeper form of buck or a new version of buck breaking or the demasculization of Kyrie Irving, what it's doing is it's like putting Kyrie Irving at the front and saying, your apology is not good enough because you didn't do it at the time we said you need to do it. And so now we're going to give you a list of things that you have to fulfill in order to come back to our franchise. And I don't agree with all of those things. And Jalen Brown, who is the vice president of the National Basketball Players Association, says that, you know, the union also has issues with this and they are going to um, uh, file an appeal on Kyrie's uh, suspension. So there's a lot of people feeling some type of way about this. Now, I don't I also don't feel that Kyrie Irving was intentionally anti-Semitic when posting this. I haven't watched the film. I don't know what's in the film. or I don't know what's in the documentary. I don't know what's true and what's not true. I think he watched a documentary that he um, aligned himself with. I think he found some things in that documentary that you know spoke to something that he appreciated. Um, but much like a lot of films, there's some things that in there that you might not agree with, but you still think, you know what, this is a, this is a good film. Um, but in order for him to be reinstated, for him to have to fulfill these requirements, seems ridiculous. Especially make a five hundred thousand dollar donation to anti hate causes. Come on, you guys! Like we haven't seen this ever. We haven't seen this ever. And I don't think Kyrie Irving's behavior is so poor that he needs to have an institution outline what he needs to do in order to come back. However, if I think about being a part of an organization in a time where anti-Semitism is being highly discussed and, and talked about, I think they're doing this to deter 
anybody else from 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 acting out or for not following the institutional guidelines and policies. Um, and so this alone, um, if nothing else, is going to have players think about their next move, right? So Kyrie Irving, while he apologized, he didn't apologize the way that the league wanted him to. He didn't do it in the time they wanted him to. Um, he didn't follow their method, okay? Um, and so because he did not follow their method, it's like this is repercussions for his actions. You know, it's like, oh, okay, you, yeah, well, we asked you to apologize first and you didn't do it in our timing. So now we need you to complete this, this sensitivity training. We need you to complete this anti-Semitism training. What I would say is, if Kyrie Irving has to do this, why are we not doing this for everyone? Why isn't there already sensitivity training for players in the league? Why isn't there um, anti-Semitism training or anti-Blackness training or anti-anything training for your players? Like, as a whole, why is the league not saying, you know what? We want to ensure all of our players in this institution aligned with our organization understand and can complete this cultural competency. Why is that not a part of what they want to do amongst everyone? And so that is why I feel like this is modern day buck breaking. Um, I don't stand with anti-Semitism. Um, I don't stand for hate for anyone. Um, but when you do place these kind of guidelines, what you're going to see is that black folks are going to look at this and say, oh, you want him to do what after he already did what? Oh, no, 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 no. Because that's what it feels like to us. So if we are going to say that he should be suspended, suspend him. If you want him off the team, kick him off the team. But to have him go through and fulfill all of these requirements, to me, just feels like that extra push that's totally unnecessary. And so I don't support that. I'm looking forward to um, the MB, the MBPA um, and their appeal. I don't think they'll win it. Um, in fact, I'm not even sure if Kyrie Irving has fulfilled all of these things. If you guys can let me know, I do feel like I remember, and I could be very wrong, that he attempted to make a donation uh, to an anti-hate cause or to a Jewish um, related cause, and they returned his money. They didn't want to accept his donation, and I get it. I mean, I wouldn't want if, <laughs> why would you? Um, so I think the attempt was probably good enough. But we'll see. Um, we will see what happens. I hope that um, people can look at this from both sides um, and understand that Kyrie Irving is a human being and that we all tend to make mistakes or don't fully understand um, how our alignment with some things may, may make others feel inferior or make them feel pain or hurt. Um, and that we're able to say, okay, you know what? That's not cool. And I understand why that's not cool. But to take it a step further, um, which I think the league is, I'm disappointed in that. And I, I, I don't stand and I don't agree with that at all. All right, you guys, I have some other stories. Have you guys heard about this? There is a girl named Shanquilla Robinson and on, I believe, Sunday, Sunday night or Monday night, where she took over social media because of this wrongful or this suspicion around her death. I have a video. Um, we're going to play the video and then we'll come back and we'll talk about that. Cuddy, can you go ahead and play that Shanquilla Robinson video? It's like a nightmare, man. It's, it's you know, I can't even sleep. Um, I, I'm just frustrated. My heart is just aching, man. And, you know, as a father, man, you know, a praying man. Bernard Robinson is begging for answers about how his daughter, Shanquella, died last month in Cabo. I just want some truth, because this don't even add up right. He says he and his wife were told Shanquella died of alcohol poisoning, but the autopsy says she died due to injuries to the spinal cord and neck. 
A video has now also surfaced showing someone attacking Shinquella. Through the grace of God, I think I'm gonna get to the bottom of it, sir. God ain't gonna, ain't God, God, God not gonna fail me. It's gonna come out. It's gonna come out. Information out of Cabo authorities has been difficult to obtain, so I called phone numbers associated with all of her friends who went on the trip. The subscriber you have dialed is not in service. Most of the numbers are now disconnected, but two of them went straight to voicemail. Sorry, mailbox is full. I texted both of them and also paid them a visit since they have Charlotte addresses. No one answered at the first store and the same with the second. And while no one was home when I rang the doorbell this afternoon, a neighbor did tell me this morning they spotted CMPD outside this person's home. I sent an email to CMPD asking why they were there. CMPD says they are not involved in the investigation since the case happened in Mexico. I also sent an email to the records division asking for a police report, and I was told it will take 24 hours for it to be available. As Channel 9 continues to seek answers, so does Shanquilla's dad. I'm not giving up. I'm, I'm, I am not giving up. I'm very confident that I'm going to get, I'm going to have a peace of mind. All right, you guys. So this is a tragic story of all y'all, your friends ain't your friends. So. Let me help you guys piece the story together. So Shanquilla, she's 25. She went from Chicago, uh, Charlotte to Cabo with a group of friends. Um, the day she got there, she sent a message to her mom and said, you know, the chef is here. You know, he's getting he, making us some food, some tacos, some salad and stuff. You know, her mom was like, go ahead, have a good time. So she got to speak to her um, her daughter then. Actually, I think it was a phone call and they spoke on the phone and everything was all good. Well, her friends called the mom the next day and said, Shanquilla is not feeling good. She's not doing good. We think she has alcohol poisoning. There was a boyfriend. I don't know if he's a boyfriend or if he's just someone that she's like romantically kind of involved with. He is the only friend who came out and did a video posting to talk about what happened or, or his version of stories that happened. So he says he didn't show up the same day that everyone else did. He came a day later. When he got there, he called the friends at the villa who said, Shanquilla is not feeling good. We think she got alcohol poisoning. The concierge and the nurse are going to come over here and check her out. He says when he got there that she was non-responsive. Okay, what I showed you guys in the news report is a video that leaked of Shanquilla being beaten by one of the girls in the villa. Okay, and you guys can go online and see the full video, but Shanquilla is totally naked. Um, the girls are the girl who's fighting her is beating her with people in the back saying. You're not going to defend yourself. You're not going to fight back. And Shaquilla says no. So she doesn't She doesn't fight back. She kind of cowers down to the ground. Um, she doesn't say anything. So this is a truly heartbreaking story. The romantic partner says that um, when he got there, you know, he's just going off the basis of the story of what happened. Um, he said that he did not notice that she had been beaten. He did notice that she did have a knot on her head um, once the nurse pointed it out. Um, but this is terrible. Um, and allegedly there's a second video uh, that hasn't come, that hasn't been leaked yet, but the, allegedly there's a second video of another girl in the video beating up Shanquilla. This to me feels like jealousy and envy. Something happened in that house that didn't have anything to do with alcohol poisoning and they beat that girl to death because there's no way that you are going to have a spinal cord injury from alcohol poisoning. Okay. And so that is the autopsy report. That's what's coming out on top of the fact. And this really raises a red flag to me is that the whole group left 
Tranquilla's body there. If I had a friend that passed in a different country, you better believe I am not leaving until everything is taken care of with my friend. I'm not going to leave my friend behind. So to me, this feels like, I mean, do you guys agree with that? If you guys were on a girl's trip or a guy's trip and one of the friends passed away, wouldn't you guys all stay? I don't care if you have to stay in a shitty hotel, but wouldn't you stay until you are able to have, you know, I would be there for the mom. I would be there for Miss Robinson to say, okay, look, Miss Robinson, I'm not going anywhere until I see Shanquilla body boarded up on that flight. We're going to get to the bottom of it. I'm going to be her eyes and ears. I'm going to make sure she is transported back to the United States and everything is taken care of for you. The mother did not get Shanquilla's body back until two weeks because of the cost that it took to fly the body back. So it was $6,000. So she had to raise money to get the body back and then work with all of these other entities to determine the cause of death and this and the third, because she said, how is it? that my daughter suffered from alcohol poisoning. She had only been there less than 24 hours. So you can't, so the mother had no idea what happened until she got that death certificate. So this is interesting. All of the friends um, have either disconnected their phones, uh, disabled their social media accounts, and nobody's talking. The sad thing is, is that there is no jurisdiction for this. So the United States cannot formally investigate this and criminally charge these individuals. And so it is on the Mexican government and possibly uh, the U.S. Embassy to collaborate and figure out what's going on. I suspect that the Robinson family is going to hire a private investigator to determine what happened and try to piece this together. Um, there has not been a toxicology report that has been released. Um, I have read in news reports that there just is not, um, how can I say this, that there's just not, um, that they, they don't suspect that it was uh, alcohol poisoning, that she did not die from alcohol poisoning, but that does not say whether or not she had alcohol in her system. I would like to know how much alcohol she had in her system. Okay. That would be, I, I'm interested in that. And so I am going to stay on this case. Um, it is going to be justice for Shanquilla. And please, you guys be careful on who you go on these trips with. This was a very weird group of friends that got this villa to go down to Cabo. And Cabo is like the new spot. Got to know who you're going places with, but I'll be damned. If I ever go out the country and leave my friend or associate behind and, and they pass away in a different country, even a different state, I would not leave them behind. There's just no way. Like, there's no way. And they left early. So they had to change their tickets to leave early. The romantic partner, you guys, who did this, who was talking about this online, he's the only one out of like the five or six people that were there. And he's just digging a mass grave for herself. So I encourage him to keep talking. But what he's saying is, and it was my birthday weekend and I didn't get an opportunity to do anything. I didn't get to drink. I didn't get to go on jet skis. We had this boat we were supposed to go on. I didn't get to do anything. And, you know, when I got there, I was just with Quilla and I was just rubbing her head and just, you know, trying to make sure she was OK. It just doesn't feel right. If Rodney showed up to a trip and I was sick and non-responsive, there would be no way that he would not be looking me over from head to toe. There's just no way. There would be no way that my good, good girlfriends would not be looking me over from head to toe to say, what is wrong with you? If she had this spinal cord injury, even if it wasn't something that you couldn't see, if you knew you guys got into an altercation, into a fight, more should have been done. And so this is absolutely a cover up. Um, so there's there's that, you guys. Well, look, let's take a quick break. When we come back, I have some big news I want to share with y'all. So stay tuned. You're watching Clap Back Culture. Join us this holiday season at the Fifth Avenue Theater and feel the power of love overflowing with the Wiz. 
filled with soaring soul and R&B songs. It's an effervescent explosion of music, dance, and magic your whole family will love. Ease on down the yellow brick road with Dorothy as she learns home isn't really where you live. It's who you love. The Wiz at the Fifth Avenue Theater, November 19th through December 23rd. Tickets at fifthavenue.org. Hey Portland, Basic Gordon here. Not sure if you heard, but Trap Kitchen Weekend starts this Friday, November 18th at the Roseland Theater in downtown Portland. And you already know, Converge Media has joined hands with the Trap Kitchen and we will be in the building. Join me, my Converge fam, Cool Nuts, G Perico, J Worthy, and Manny Blanco from VH1 Black in Compton as we celebrate food, music, and culture in a way that only the Trap Kitchen can. See you Friday for Trap Kitchen Weekend at the Roseland Theater and be sure to follow Trap Kitchen PDX for more details and get your tickets today at roselandpdx.com. COVID-19 hurt my income, my health, and my family. We were about to lose our home when we heard we might be eligible for homeowner assistance funds from the government. We called 1-877-894-HOME, and a housing counselor stepped in, talked to our lender, and saved our home. Federal funding details at WashingtonHalf.org. That's WashingtonHAF.org. Habari Ghani. My name is Noni Irvin, and I am the creator and founder of Canara Park Kids, as well as the president of our sister nonprofit, Black Four Charities, a 501c3 fiscally sponsored by Shunpike. Together, we are hosting the Kwanzaa Awards because it is important that we acknowledge and recognize the contributions and efforts of individuals and organizations who are showing us what the Kwanzaa principles look like throughout the year. The nomination window is open October 1st to November 30th, and yes, you can submit more than one nomination. Eligibility is simple. Individual award recipients must identify as Black, African-American, or Pan-African. And organization award recipients must be 100% Black-owned if for-profit or 100% Black-led if nonprofit. All right, y'all, welcome back to Clapback Culture. This is the last segment before our show is over, and I wanted to share with you guys some good news. So as you guys may remember, I told you I had a baby shower and gender reveal combination. So I know you guys are interested to know what is the baby. Cuddy, let's play that video. Oh, it's in the box. It's in the box, y'all. Yeah. She got the key. She got the key, y'all. Let's see what pop out. Drum roll, please. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. Since I was a boy, I made a lot of mistakes, but I made you a lot of promises. I've come through all my promises, except this one right here. I'm so thankful for everything that you've had, and it's so important to me when we talk about breaking chains that I really break this chain of being accountable in a way that I need to be accountable. I'm ready to be the man that you need me to be. Yeah. I'm ready to stand on my word in a real way. Yeah. And I'm ready to take you with me. I'm ready to take care of you. And I'm ready to do this thing the right way with this new child that's come in the world. So, Julia and each Jesse, will you be my wife?
you guys. I'm still teary-eyed. Okay. Um, so surprise, it's an engagement. It's a boy. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for your congratulations. Rodney and I are extremely excited. Um, he was team girl for a while, you guys. So this was good. Um, man, I'm still shocked and surprised and overwhelmed and excited. Um, and this baby is just growing and growing every day. So, you know, I keep I want to continue to bring you guys along my uh, my journey, my road to uh, discovering on what, what it means to be a mom, what it means to be a wife. Um, and so this is uh, really exciting to be able to live this, um, but also to be able to share that with you. So just a little piece of happiness before we end our show tonight. So that's it, you guys. Hashtag Black Love All Day Long. Thank you, Miss Dia. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed tonight's show topics. I will be coming back to you. Oh, next week. You guys, next week is Thanksgiving. Uh, so we won't be here, but we will be back the following week. Um, and then we're, we're going to take off for um, the holidays and we'll be back at the top of the year. So you guys know how I am. I'll be documenting everything. Make sure to follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Treasure of J-U-L-E-S. You know what it is. In the meantime, celebrate Thanksgiving with your family. Let me know something that you're grateful for. Um, eat too much food, drink a little too much wine, and just kick back and enjoy these this holiday season with your family and your loved ones. You know, this is good. This is good. This is what we do it for, right? All right, you guys. Well, I appreciate you always showing up to be a part of Clapback Culture until the week after. <laughs> I'll see you soon. Stay peaceful.